we're learning C programming, the first thing we're going to do is download Visual Studio. If you already have Visual Studio or another IDE that you know works for writing C in, then you can go ahead and click the timestamp in the description and skip the next few minutes while we're downloading Visual Studio. Just going to go to Google, type Visual Studio 2022. We want the first result. Hit download community 2022. Run the executable that just downloaded. And this is just going to set up the installer for us. Hit continue. There's a lot of options here. You can choose whatever you're going to be using Visual Studio for. I'm going to be using it for desktop development with C++ because I'm just coding in C and C++. You can always change this later too. You're not just stuck with these development packages once you pick them and install. And in the bottom right corner, it just shows you how much space it's going to take up. So mine's taking up 8.97 gigabytes. I'm just going to hit install. This stuff's going to take a while. It's downloading nine gigabytes of stuff, and then it's going to install it after. It's done downloading. Now it's asking me to sign in. I'm just going to hit skip this for now. Start Visual Studio. I'm going to hit create a new project. And I'll just make a console app in C++. It'll just give me a program that prints hello worlds just to test that everything's working. Choose the name and the location that you're going to save your files to. I'm going to hit place solution and project in the same directory. Create. And I'll run this. Everything works. I just get hello world printed to the console. Now that we know everything's working, let's close all this up and let's reopen Visual Studio or whatever IDE you're using. Hit create a new project. I'm going to hit empty project in C++. If you can't see this option, then just click the drop down menu at the top and choose C++ and that'll give you all the C++ options. So I'll hit empty project and hit next. Choose the project name. I'm going to place the solution and project in the same directory. And I'm going to right click source files under the solution explorer. If you can't see the solution explorer, then you can just hit view and then solution explorer. And for this new project that we've just made, we're going to hit source files, add new item and call it whatever you want. On the end, we're going to put dot C dot CPP would be a C plus plus file, but we just want a C file. So we'll go source dot C or name it whatever you want before the dot C. There's a book written by the creators of C called the C programming language. And I'm going to take kind of the same approach that they take in their book, which is to start out with everything you need to start writing basic C programs. After that, we'll start going into detail about the functions we're using and what they're actually doing and how they work. But to start off with, I'm just going to kind of throw at you everything you need to start writing basic C programs. I'll throw a link to that book in the description, by the way, for anyone who wants to check it out. We'll start out our program by writing a main function. We'll just write the word main followed by a set of parentheses, followed by a set of braces. The main function is the code that runs when your program starts up. So everything between this brace and this brace is going to run when the program starts. Inside of our main function, let's put print f parentheses quotation marks i like c and then end it with a semicolon. Printf just prints out whatever you give it to print. And in order to use it, we have to put one more thing at the top of our program. We just write pound sign include angle brackets stdio dot h. That's standard input and output. That just tells the compiler that this program has input or output. And the compiler pretty much just imports some code that lets you have input and output inside of your program. Now let's run this by either hitting F5 or hitting this green triangle at the top of Visual Studio. And the program prints out I like C and all this other stuff that we don't really care about right now. Let's close this up and put some more stuff inside of our main function. Let's make a variable that we'll call B. And this variable will be an integer variable, which we indicate by writing the word int. int B equals zero, semicolon. 
an integer variable is just a variable that holds whole numbers inside of it. They can be positive or negative, but they can't have decimals. So we've made a variable called b and set it to zero. And so now we're going to make a while loop using our variable b and set up some fun stuff inside of the loop. We'll write while, a set of parentheses, and then a set of braces. Inside of the parentheses, we put our condition. So this loop is going to keep running as long as this condition is true. Let's say a while b is less than 10. So as long as b is less than 10, then the code inside of the braces will keep executing. Inside of the loop, we'll print out the value of b. And this is a little bit more complicated than our first printf statement. Since we're printing out a value of a variable, we're going to write printf quotation marks. Inside of the quotation marks, we're going to put the percent sign and then D. This just tells the compiler that we're printing out an integer variable. And after the quotation marks, we put a comma and then the name of that variable B. Again, just ending with a semicolon. And on the next line, we're just going to write B equals B plus one. That way, every time it goes through the loop, B is going to increase by one. Otherwise, we would have an infinite loop that just kept printing out the value of B forever. This way the loop will stop when b is no longer less than 10. So if we run this, it's going to work, but it's going to look a little bit ugly. It prints out all on the same line. I like c and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. To get everything to print out on different lines, we're going to use the new line character, which is backslash n. So that just hops it down to the next line before whatever comes next prints out. And we're going to put that inside of our second printf statement too. After the percentage d, we'll put backslash n. So now everything will print out on different lines. Now let's make another kind of variable. Let's make a double. We'll say double c equals 9.87. A double is just a variable that can hold decimal values inside of it. And inside of our while loop, let's print out the value of this double. To print out an integer in printf, we use percentage %d. To print out a double, we use percentage %f or percentage %lf. And I'll just follow that with a new line as well. And then after b, we're going to put c to indicate that the second variable that's being printed out by printf is the variable c. And when we run this, we'll just get 0, 9.87, 1, 9.87, 2, 9.87, etc. And you'll notice there's all these trailing zeros on the 9.87. We can get rid of those if we want by writing 0.2 in between the percentage sign and the LF. And that will just limit printf to only printing two digits after the decimal. Let's make another variable. This one is going to be a string. If you've written other programming languages, you'll be used to just being able to make a string by writing the word string. But in C, strings aren't actually built into the language. So instead, we just make an array of chars. We'll say char string one, and then a set of brackets equals my name is Nick. The brackets indicate that this is an array. An array is just a list of variables. The variable string one is a list of char variables. That list of char variables is just m, y, space, n, a, m, e, etc. Char is just short for character. So string one is a list of characters. And let's print this to the console as well. Let's just say print f percentage s, s is for string, percentage s string one. And let's put a new line in there too. So we've got our main function doing some cool stuff now. And let's write out a second function that we're going to call from inside of main. So after the last brace in main, I'm just going to go down a few lines and I'm going to type void function one, a set of parentheses and a set of braces. The void just indicates that this function doesn't return anything, which will make more sense in a minute once we start playing around with it. Let's just write printf function one is executing. And function one we can call from inside of our main method. Just by typing function one, a set of parentheses and a semicolon. So when the program starts up, everything up here will execute. And when it reaches function one, then it's going to jump down to here and execute whatever is inside of function one and then it'll continue with whatever's after function one. 
Now, the only problem with this, as we have it right now, is that at this point in the program, the program doesn't know what function one is, since it's defined all the way down here and we're calling it all the way up here. So what we do is we just copy and paste this void function one and put it at the top of the program above the main method, ending with a semicolon. This is called a function prototype, and it just lets the program know that there's a function called function one that's gonna be called at some point. And the prototype up here has to match the declarator down here. Right now, our declarator is just the return type, which is void and the function name. So now we are all good to run this and function one can be accessed from inside of the main function. So we get, I like C, my name is Nick, function one is executing, and then all of our numbers printing out. I'll just put a new line inside of function one just to keep everything clean. And we used the word void in front of our function name. This just means that the function doesn't pass anything back to the main function. So the function just kind of does its thing and doesn't send any information back to the main method. If we want the function to send back information to the main method, then we change the return type and we just change it to whatever type of information we want to send back. So if we say int function one, then this just indicates that function one is going to send an integer value back to the main function. So inside of our main function, we could say something like int num one equals function one. And now whatever value function one passes back to the main method, it's going to be stored inside of our variable number one. To send this value back inside of the function, we're just going to write return and then whatever integer value we want to send back. I'll just send back the number five. And since we changed our return type down here, we have to go back up to our function prototype and change void to int. And just to show that our value is coming back, let's type print f percentage d num one. The d, remember, is just to print out integer values. It actually stands for decimal, which can be kind of confusing since integers don't have decimals. It's more just referring to decimal as in indicating that it's a number in base 10. So we'll print out the value of num1 followed by a new line. And we'll run this. And somewhere in here is going to be the value five. There it is that we sent back from function one and printed out. There's a few advantages to using functions in our code. One of them is that it helps you write less code. So if you have the same code appearing in your program multiple times, then you can just throw it inside of a function. And every time you want to use it, all you have to do is call that function. Another benefit of them is that they make your programs easier to read and understand. So when you have longer programs, then instead of writing a ton of code inside of your main method, you can just say something like get value and then do stuff to value and send value. Each of these functions might have a lot of code inside of them, and then it's just easier to follow along with the program if you can look inside of the main method and see, okay, what this program does is it gets the value, it does stuff to it, and then it just sends the value off. Instead of looking in main and seeing a ton of code and not really being sure what the program's doing unless you actually read all that code. One last thing I want to look at for anyone who's using Visual Studio is the debugger. I'll make it quick since I'm sure not everyone's using Visual Studio. What I would say is just make sure you find out how to use the debugger in whatever IDE that you're using. So in Visual Studio, we can just click this little blue bar on the left hand side of the screen and put in breakpoints into our program. And that way when the program runs, it's going to stop at these breakpoints. And when it hits them, we can see what the values of everything in the program are, which is super convenient when your programs aren't doing what you want them to and you can't figure out why. So if we run this now, then it's going to stop at this first breakpoint. First, it's going to say that there's an error. Let's see what it's saying. Ah, I left all these function calls in here that don't actually exist. So if we run this now, then it'll stop at our breakpoint. So it started running, it printed out I like C, and then it stopped before it executed this line, which is double C equals 9.87. And a new window showed up in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. This just has our variables, and it shows what their values are at this point in the program. So the only one that's been initialized is B, which has a value of zero, and all of our other variables right now just have garbage values. 
which is just the value that's in a variable before you actually assign it the value that you want to. So now we can hit continue or F5. They both do the same thing. They're just gonna jump the program down to the next breakpoint. And from here, we can hit F10 if we want to just run the rest of the program line by line, or you can hit step over at the top of Visual Studio. And this will just bring it through the program line by line. I'm going to stop it and run it again so that we can see what the other option does, which is F11. F10 brought us through the main function line by line. And when it gets to the call to function one, then it just jumps down to the next line, line 14 here but F11 would actually bring us to the first line of function one. So right now we're on line 13. If we hit F11, then it brings us to function one, whereas F10 would have just executed function one and jumped right down to the next line inside of the main function. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'll put a lot of awesome resources in the description if anyone wants to check them out. Just some videos and some good books to read.